remember the second part of that, uh, but let me address the first part first. Um, I mean, food deserts are a tremendous problem. There is an assumption that the reason people in the inner city eat junk food is because that's what they want to eat. Um, there's a lot of fast food in the inner city, there's not a lot of supermarkets. But that does not reflect the desire of consumers in these places, and we know that. The reason there's a lot of fast food in the inner city is partly the result of policy. Um, we lent lots of money in the 60s and 70s, small business loans, to entrepreneurs in the inner city. And the easiest business you could get into was a franchise. Um, and we thought this was a good idea. And in some ways it was a good idea. We were starting local businesses. Um, but you see the power of policy. Um, we can do things at the policy level to encourage grocers to come into neighborhoods. And in fact, there's some very interesting experiments going on in New York City where they rewrote the zoning laws. And if you bring in a, uh, a store that has a certain number of square foot of fresh produce into Harlem, you then can build a little higher or wider or whatever. You get a certain incentive. In, in New York, they're always trading air rights for other things because real estate's so expensive. So by, by getting stores to fulfill some social good, like more produce in the inner city, they give something else. Uh, so it's a, it's a really interesting question, and planners have a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, I don't know that we have the proven way to do this yet, um, but we could offer tax incentives, zoning incentives, to get grocers into the inner city. The other thing that's been tried with some success in many communities is offering, uh, giving, uh, food stamp recipients and WIC recipients uh, and Social Security recipients farmers market vouchers. Yeah. And, uh, we've done this on a pilot basis with federal money. How can they get there? There's no, there's no market there. The market shows up. When you have a lot of vouchers given out, there's a market in San Diego. You know, uh, uh, a very depressed part of San Diego, California, a uh, very ethnic area, and um, they started this Wholesome Wave Foundation, which is a foundation um, uh, in Connecticut, but doing this work nationally, where they give out these double voucher programs. When they dump a lot of vouchers in a certain community, the farmers markets follow the vouchers. And so that's one way. If you give, if you have the buying power, the markets will come. And um, so that's something I think we need to we need to work on as citizens with our nonprofits, um, and also you know getting the Department of Agriculture uh, to support this. Um, there is no reason too that that the government, you know, it's interesting. We subsidize commodity crops. We subsidize corn and soy and rice and cotton and wheat. And um, and people often say to me, well, couldn't we subsidize produce? And actually, it's you can't. It's not doesn't work quite the same way because it's very hard to subsidize something that's not a storable commodity. Like if you subsidize broccoli tomorrow, you would have way too much broccoli within about you know six months, and you can't do anything with it. Um, it rots. Whereas corn, you can put in a silo or you know you can store it for like five years. So how do you subsidize uh, fresh produce? Well, one way to do it is to subsidize the stores and give them, uh, pay them for um, the amount that they move through their store. So they will lower the prices of it. Um, so there's, there, you know, this is when I am out of my depth because I'm a writer, I'm not a policy maker. And this is the kind of creativity we need. I mean, we need people in this movement who understand and are incredibly creative about designing policy machineries that will give us the outcomes we want. But we can figure out how to do this. And, um, but I, I often don't know, you know exactly how to do it. But there are ways to do it. And it is an important problem. And I'll get to the microwave in a second. The microwave. Uh, you know, the microwave is a big, is a big problem. I mean, it's, uh, I have a microwave. I think it's great for reheating a cup of tea. Um, and every now and then I'm forced to use it to defrost something. Um, but it has changed eating in America in ways that I don't think we've completely recognized. Um, one of the things it did was help destroy the family dinner because it allowed food manufacturers to create entrees 
for each member of the family. And uh, so you didn't have to just make one thing. So you could have the pizza for the boy, and you could have the, you know, I don't know, the chicken pot pie for the girl, and something else for the mom, and the manhandler for the dad. And, you know, so suddenly we had all these, all these different foods. But the problem is since the microwave takes so damn long for a uh, convenience device, um, and can only do one at a time, it leads to this kind of serial eating instead of shared eating. So what, one of the things, when I was writing about, I, I did some uh, interviews at General Mills and I talked to their marketing people. And they told me that, uh, yeah, no, the family meal it still exists, but it's different now. And they know this because they put cameras up in, in, the, in the ceilings of people's houses and watch how they actually eat. And if you ask them, they'll say, oh yeah, we still have family meal five nights a week. But if you actually watch, what happens is that, you know, they take turns in the microwave and then sitting down at the table and one is there and then the other one leaves and nobody's actually there at the same time because the food's not ready. And they're each eating a different thing. I think eating the same thing is a really important principle. I think it puts us on the... No, I really do. I think even at a biological level, if people are eating the same food, they're kind of in the same place emotionally. I mean, food has an effect on mood. And, and if we're all eating, you know, Chinese, Italian, French, you know, it's the same meal. It's, I don't think it's conducive to, uh, to good social life. <laughs>